vast expanse of space, in the birth clouds of newly formed stars, in the ethereal winds of dying stars, and even in our own spiral Milky Way, a special class of organic chemical compounds can be found everywhere. These same compounds are found in the hazy wisps of smoke from cigarettes, the exhaust from cars, incinerating garbage, and in smoked or charcoal grilled meat. These carcinogenic, teratogenic, and mutagenic molecules are comprised solely of the elements carbon and hydrogen, but these many ring or polycyclic aromatic structures are especially hazardous to human and animal health. 16 are so toxic that the Environmental Protection Agency considers them priority pollutants and recommends their routine monitoring in air, soil, and water. Besides normal combustion processes, PAHs are also found in crude oil. In May of 2010, an underwater explosion on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico led to the largest marine oil spill in history. Nearly 4.1 million gallons of oil rushed into the water, just 41 miles off the Louisiana coast. These waters were home to fish, birds, mollusks, and other marine life. The waters also supported the fishing industry and provided a much needed boost to tourism. Since then, researchers are looking not just to measure the PAHs in the air, but also our waters and the marine life that live there. How can we know if we're being exposed to cancer-causing PAHs? Professor Andreas Campiglia at the University of Central Florida has pioneered fluorescent techniques for measuring PAH levels in samples ranging from contaminated water to soil. So what is the main focus of your research on PAHs? Okay, so the main goal of my research is to uh, develop methods of detection for PAHs that are not uh, commonly detected by other methods, namely chromatographic methods. Basically, we are looking for PAHs that are a challenge for the methods that they already exist. So is it important to identify PAHs? In terms of ass assessing human risk, we need to know if the most toxic isomers are in the samples that are in contact with humans. And in addition to that, since not much is known about these PAHs, we really don't know what isomers are environmentally relevant. For example, if we think about the molecular weight 302, there are anywhere between 85 to 88 isomers. If we knew which ones are environmentally relevant, then we can target them, and that will save money, time, and it will increase the number of samples that we can analyze and prevent uh, human risk. So if knowing the amount of PAHs and their structures is so important, how can we measure those two properties? One of the most used techniques to determine PAHs in the environment is mass spectrometry. And many of these isomers with the same molecular weight, they have um, very similar, identical fragmentation patterns. So it's very difficult to determine them with the methods that exist at this moment. So instead of using mass spectra to identify these compounds, what we are using is a technique that we call laser excited time resolved Sipolsky spectroscopy. It's a long name, but the technique is very simple. Basically, what we are looking at is the vibrational spectrum of the fluorescence emission. So we excite the sample, and each one of these compounds will emit radiation with a characteristic wavelength versus intensity pattern. We also have different wavelengths that we can excite this fluorescence. So we can excite a targeted PAH and avoid the emission of all the others in the sample. And on top of that, we look at the time that it takes for the fluorescence to fade off. And that time is what we call the lifetime of the PAH, which is also a characteristic of the PAH that we can use to identify the PAH. So we will have excitation wavelengths, emission spectra with vibrational resolution, which means many different lines in that spectrum with characteristic wavelengths, and the lifetime. 
And so far, for the few isomers that we have analyzed, all the emission patterns are different, the excitation wavelengths are different, and the lifetimes are different. So we are very comfortable uh, thinking that we can differentiate all the relevant isomers in the environment with this technique. So the wavelengths of light emitted by the PAHs and the time they emit that light tells you which PAH you've got? So let, let's think in terms of um, room temperature spectra. Room temperature spectra are very broad bands. Okay? So imagine that you have two PAHs, PAH1, PAH2. And I, these two occur in a region okay, that is uh, similar. So I have an overlap, of overlapping of bands that I can't resolve. Uh, when I lower the temperature, what happens is that the band becomes very narrow. So now, instead of having that broad band, I have only two narrow lines, and even though they show up in the same spectral region, they don't overlap, and I can't determine them. Basically, what you have to do is you have to get an alkane with the right length, and you basically dissolve your sample in that alkane and then you measure the spectrum at very low temperature and that gives you the narrowing. The lowest temperatures we can get is when, with liquid helium. And liquid helium, the equivalent temperature in Celsius is minus 270 degrees. And when you reach that temperature, the N-alkane freezes, crystallizes and the PAH is basically part of that crystal lattice and that gives you a perfect narrowing. So when you measure the admitted fluorescent spectrum and decay at frigid liquid helium temperatures, does it provide identifying information for which PAH you have in your sample? One interesting aspect of, of this uh, approach that we use with the cryogenic fiber optic probe is that we can uh, do full analysis in microliters of sample. Since we don't need to separate the PAHs, microliters of, some, of organic solvent is all we need. So we are talking here about doing complete analysis with microliters of sample, microliters of organic solvents, and reaching limits of detection at the parts per trillion to parts per quadrillion level. So what challenges are you still facing today in analyzing PAHs? Let's go back to those 302 molecular weight PAHs. Structurally, there are 85 to 88 possible isomers, but there are only 23 that are commercially available. So basically, that limits our capability to do the analysis if we only think in terms of commercially available standards. We are going to use uh, computational chemistry to predict the spectra of the isomers that are not commercially available. I'm always thinking about adding new dimensions to my data format because the more dimensions I add, the more selective my method is going to be. We are thinking along the lines of adding electric fields to our fiber optic probe. We think that the ways the PAHs will respond to the electric field and their vibrational spectra is going to be unique for each one of the PAHs. Is that a new challenge? Implementing that in a way that everybody can use is the challenge. Generated in the fiery furnaces of combustion, the detection, identification, and quantification of PAHs is accomplished in the sub-freezing temperatures of liquid helium. Empowered with that knowledge, we'll be capable of protecting the soil we plant, the water we thrive in, and the air we breathe.